Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Condo Insider. Uh, my name is Jane Sugimura, and I'm going. I'm your host for this episode. And Condo Insider is a show about condominium living and people who work and uh, uh, work around and live in condos. And today, my guest is Raylene Tenno. She's a uh, program director for Hawaii Council of Community Associations. Thank you, Raylene, for coming, being on my show. Thank you, Jane. Thank you for asking me to be here today. And we're going to have to call this a Raylene and Jane <laughs> show pretty soon. But anyway, we've got another topic about, con and, and this is a, a very kind of tricky topic. And uh, what we're going to be talking about is the uh, request uh, for reasonable accommodation that residents and condominiums have to uh, uh, ask their board. And basically, the, 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 base, the reason for the re request for reasonable accommodations is the, uh, is the uh, residential type of uh, law. It's called um, fair housing, right? right? And it, that, <coughs> that's the uh, ADA law, American for Disability Act. law, that applies to commercial buildings. The, the counterpart that applies to residential buildings is the fair housing. And this is the, the law that says, uh, if you're disabled, that um, the owner of the property has to make, uh, allow reasonable accommodation so that you as a uh, disabled person uh, can have the same enjoyment of uh, their unit, residential unit, as a person who's not disabled. Correct. Okay, Correct. So, and this is a federal law. <clears throat> this is a federal law. So, you know, this is big, big fines right. and big enforcement. You can't play with it. <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't play around with this. So, you know, you have to make sure that, um, you know, you kind of know what the law is. Or if you don't know uh, and you're faced with a situation, you know, where somebody comes and makes a reasonable a request for a reasonable accommodation, the first thing you do if you don't know is you contact the association council and you say, I have a request for a reasonable accommodation. What do I do? Right, 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 right. And 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 and, and listen to the attorney. I mean, uh, I mean that that's where you you go. I mean, sometimes you know the property managers know how to handle this, but if you're not sure, and if your staff is not sure, that's the first thing you need to do is make sure you have advice of counsel. Because if you make a mistake, the um, the agency that enforces fair housing is the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission. Correct. Correct. And, and also legal aid will take action too. Okay, but the, the Hawaii Civil Rights Commission, I mean, they're the ones who come down and issue big fines, yep. right? Big, big fines. Big time. Big time. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've, I've been told that they're not nice. No, they're not. It's they're not, they're, they're it's not, not nice and, yeah. and, and sometimes they can be heavy handed and, um, and you know, people grumble, but, uh, you know, so, so and, and it's easy for a, a, a person who wants to make a claim, they just go down there and talk to somebody, and the next thing you know, you got an investigator. You get a letter in the mail saying, you know, John Doe has uh, come, come into our office and alleged that you discriminated against him in violation of fair housing, and we <laughs> want all your paperwork, and we want your firstborn child, and, you know, everything else. And it's years. It's years of, of litigation. They'll bring you in for depositions. Um, they want all your paperwork. <clears throat> yeah, they'll even attend. I believe they'll even attend some of your board meetings. Yeah, I, I heard. You know, it, it 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 can be really scary. Yeah. And so, for those of you out there, and when somebody makes a request for a reasonable accommodation, don't fool around. Like I said, you know, contact uh, you know your managing agent. If the managing agent doesn't know how to handle it, you contact the association's general counsel because this is serious stuff. Okay, so fair housing, it basically says that if, if um, you're the owner of a building, and in this case it's a condominium, so we're talking about the board of directors, and somebody lives in the unit, doesn't have to be an owner, it's a resident mm -hmm. who is disabled, and they want, a re they want to make, and when they ask for a reasonable accommodation, this means that they want to make a request that kind of goes against the, the, norm. the, the norm, the existing rules. And like if it's construction, somebody in a wheelchair may need to widen the doorway, right? right? So right. they have to uh, widen the doorways and replace the doors 
or you know, if they have mobility problems, may they want to put handles on the wall so uh, grips, right, 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 so that they can. And you know, uh, a lot of these, I mean, um, if it's inside the unit, it, you you only have to get the the owner's consent. But if it's outside, like a door, right, you would have to get the the board's consent. And and going back to the wheelchair example, let's Ramps. say you want to put a ramp, right, and the ramp. Because sometimes uh, buildings have stairs, mm -hmm. sh short stairs. And so, yes, you can put in a ramp. But if you're the person making the request, uh, Fair Housing says you pay for it. Correct. You bore, bear the cost. You bear the cost <coughs> of putting in the, the ramp. The, the, if once you make the request and if you can, uh, uh, you know, uh, meet the test about, you know, being disabled and you can show that you have mobility problems and you need that ramp, they cannot refuse you. You then have to go out and get an engineer or Correct. whatever, get the proper permits, and you have to pay to put in this ramp. And the association can make you pay to remove it Correct. when you leave. Correct. Right? Yes. And for, for all of those things, uh, you know, you need to write a letter uh, to the board, and, and, and that request, the letter to the board, is the request for reasonable accommodation. You're basically saying, I'm disabled. I need for the board to give me permission to make a change to my unit or to the building, mm -hmm. you know, so that I can enjoy my, my stay here just like somebody else who isn't disabled. Right. And, you know, we're, we're hearing some really strange things about people with allergies, mm -hmm. right? Yes. yes. People with allergies. And so that means that they might be allergic to the cleaning stuff that the housekeeping people use. Cleaning, cutting grass. That's right, cutting grass. <laughs> and, you know, so this raises all kinds of problems because it's like, well, what are we supposed to do now? Right. You know, and it's not like you can, you can say, oh, well, uh, <laughs> you know, you have to go and get some allergy medicine or something. <laughs> I mean, that's right away, that's a, that's a violation because right. <laughs> you're not allowing them, you know, uh, to, to uh, kind of uh, uh, modify the rules. And they're coming to you and saying, I'm disabled, you got to change your rules, mm -hmm. which means you got to change the way you do housekeeping, maybe buy non-hypoallergenic -al products, or at least products that don't set off the allergies that this right. resident right. has. Do it, try to do the, use that detergent or whatever, when maybe the person's always known to be at work. So it's yeah. not when they're occupying the unit and then you're trying to clean with the stuff that um, aggravates her allergies, right. or even like asthma, yeah. some of it could activate the asthma. And, and so, so, you know, this, you know there, there's a whole gamut uh, of things that a person uh, can request. And, you know, and, and, and some, you know, board members, you know, who, who may not know, uh, be aware of the law or may not be sensitive, I mean, they're, you know, they're likely to just try to brush it off and say, well, you know, you need to go and get some whatever allergy medicine or, right. uh, you know, or, you know, we don't want you to put up a ramp because it's going to be ugly. You know, they can't, you know, we, what, what, you, what you guys who are listening to this have to understand is you can't do that. Right. If the person is disabled and they come to the board and they say, because of my disability, I need a ramp. And, and, and if they're willing to pay for it and they go out and get the permits, I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do. But, right. you know, you, you, you need to grant it and, uh, you, you, and, and they do have to pay for it. Right. You know, so it's not like it's going to cost the association money. And I can remember one, uh, one incident, and this is a townhouse project, mm -hmm. and you couldn't get a ramp up the, they were in the second floor unit. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get the ramp up the stairs. It would have to because with the building code, it, it would literally have to go around the building in a circle right. to meet the code requirements. And so what happened is they took the lanai, they took and opened up the lanai, because what happened is the resident who'd been living there for like 20 years, she had some kind of a, I don't know what kind of illness it was, but they had to amputate, uh, you know, a portion of her leg and her other leg was somehow, you know, uh, affected so she couldn't walk. You know, she couldn't even stand. So oh she was God. in a wheelchair. And so basically if she wanted to live in this second story townhouse, the only way she could do it is if they could get a ramp from the lanai. And so, and what happened is, you know, with, uh, with townhouses, they have courtyards. Right. Right? 
So there's this ramp that came into the courtyard. <laughs> and some of the, you know, the, the, I think it was maybe four, eight, right? And then right. there's a courtyard. Right. And every, everybody kind of used it, you know, for playground. playground. And so there was some pushback. pushback. But there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a whole lot. And it right. wasn't, I don't think it was that intrusive. It was from the second floor, and they made one zig and then one zag. Yeah. Right. You know, so, so right. that it would the, take the whole car. Yeah, I can, I can right. So, that. so that the wheelchair could go, but that was the only way she could live right. in her unit, stay right. in her unit. And, uh, and, and I, I think she was able to live like that for maybe three years. And then when she passed, you know, her Let's family down. tore it down. But that was one of the more extreme. Yeah, that is, that is, yeah, that's really, really extreme. Right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and we had to, Tell the people, I mean, it, it did kind of break up their playground, but it wasn't like they lost, you know, square foot. I mean, they could still put their swing set and this sandbox. You know, they just had to it's really work compassion. around. Really, it's compassion on everybody's part. You know? And, you know, they have to understand that as the, so, and it wasn't their land. It was common, common area, elements, yeah. right? The, the courtyard is common area. The fact that the association allowed them to have swing sets and a sandbox and, stuff i mean it was an accommodation to them as well right. so you know when 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 you know they were told okay the only way you know we can put in and uh, this um um you know ramp and this is the only way she could live in the unit and it and it and it wasn't and, and it wasn't as if you know she was a new person or a renter she was a 20-year owner who got sick you know and 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 all of these things and these things happen mm -hmm. And, right. and so I guess, you know, what, you know, we need to tell people who live in condominiums is you have to be flexible, you have to be sensitive, mm -hmm. and you have to understand that this is a federal law with really big consequences that could, you know, affect the association big time as far as fines and lawyers and all that bad stuff that yeah. comes with, yeah. uh, you know, uh, litigation. And you're up against the federal government. So, you know, you, you, you really need to uh, make sure that you understand the law. And when a, a, a somebody comes in with something called a request for accommodation, the, 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 the word reasonable accommodation is the buzzword for fair housing, <laughs> right? Right. If you hear right. that, you, you hear that, then uh, you, you, you need to, you know, quick call your lawyer, call the managing agent, say, okay, what do I do? And, right. and listen and follow their instructions. Right. Correct. Right. Okay, well, we're getting into the, our, 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 our break time, and so we're going to take a one-minute break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to be talking about the other big thing about reasonable accommodations, and that's people with pets or people <laughs> who want to live in condominiums that don't allow pets, but they, they have pets. And so uh, they have to ask for a reasonable accommodation right. if the building is a no-pet building. But we'll discuss that when we get back from our break. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors. The Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Munley and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Dwayne Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. back to Condo Insider. My name is Jane Sugimura, and my, my uh, guest today is Raylene Tenno, and we're talking about uh, 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 requests for reasonable accommodations and how do you deal with them. And uh, the short answer is you treat them very seriously. You take them very seriously, and you don't try to slough them off or try to uh, ignore them. They don't go away, and uh, the consequences are huge 
if you violate their housing. Correct. You pay attention to those. Right. So in the, the first part of the show, we were talking about uh, different types of uh, requests for reasonable accommodation that dealt with um, changes to the unit, to the building, and uh, or if you know the the building uses chemicals, you know that trigger allergies in people. And but the one, the one I guess contentious area is pets. Right. Everybody. Well, first of all, everybody knows about service animals, and service animals are allowed everywhere. Okay, and, and that means if you have a no pets policy, they, you, the federal law under fair housing says you must allow a service animal. And service animals, uh, unfortunately, are not registered mm -hmm. by right. federally right. or in the state of Hawaii, right? Right, right. There's no registry system at all. So if you see a dog with a jacket or, you know, something that says, you know, service animal, I mean... They, they can get them on the internet, right? Correct. That correct. doesn't make them a service animal. Right, right. And, and, and by definition, a service animal is, some, is an animal, and it doesn't have to be a dog. It can be a miniature horse, I correct. believe. Yes. But, you know, th they are animals that are trained specially to assist a person with a disability. And the only question, and because they're not certified, you can't ask them for certification or proof that they are ser service animals because there is no such certification or paper proof, mm -hmm. or you can't go on the internet and find them registered anywhere. Right. There's no registry system at all. No. Nowhere. No. And, and all you can ask is, what does a dog do? Right. What right? tasks does he perform? What, what tasks does he perform? You cannot ask about the disability. That's a no-no. That's a HIPAA violation. That's big time fine. So you cannot ask about the disability, uh, you can only ask, uh, what does a dog do? Task. What tasks does a dog right. do? And you know, when, when um, it's obvious, like somebody who's blind mm -hmm. and, and, and uses a seeing eye dog, I mean, that is very obvious. But there are some, uh, s some medical situations that you know, use service animals that you can't, where the disability is not obvious. And uh, uh, what is it, uh, the, the, the soldiers who come back? PTSD. PTSD, right? I mean, they look normal, but because they have this syndrome, they have a dog, a, a service animal that's trained to deal with this syndrome. Right. They, they, they can kind of sense when that an episode's going to happen, so to speak. Yeah. And then you have these uh, dogs that help people who have mobility issues. They're usually large dogs or what is it, this, the miniature pony. Right. right. Helps them stand. Helps them stand. And so in those instances, it might not be obvious what the animal does to, right. to assist these people. But the only thing, if you are an, uh, an association, you, 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 you can ask them, what does your, your dog do? Right. What tasks does he perform? And then there's after the service <clears throat> animal. And service animals, I mean, that's a no-brainer. If it's a service animal, uh, they have to be allowed. You, some, you know, you ask for a, a reasonable accommodation, and if it's a service animal, it's a no-brainer, they must be allowed. And with service animals, they're pretty much trained, you know, so that they're not going to pee in the hallway, they're not and they're bark. not going to be aggressive, and, you know, they're always on a leash. Right, they're not going to be barking. Yeah, they, they don't bark. And so, you know, so those animals, you know, it, it, you know it, the, they don't seem to be a problem. The issue is... For people, um, and now I guess the term is emotional support animal. Right. <laughs> uh, they, these used to be the comfort animals. What else, what else were they called? Therapy animals. Therapy animals. Now the, they, they're lumped together in a category called emotional support, support. animals. What exactly is a, an emotional support animal? A pet. A pet. <laughs> Of course, if you just they call them a pet, they say, oh, no, this is not a pet. It's an emotional support animal. So I'm thinking, okay, so what is an emotional support animal? I have many at home. <laughs> but anyway, under fair housing, the association, if a, reason, a request for reasonable accommodation is made, and, it, and the request comes from a professional health care provider, the association really has no recourse but to say, okay, I guess we gotta let this person have the, the animal. Right, but just remember though, um, whoever writes that, um, that letter has to be licensed in the state and has to be one of your um, 
your physicians or doctors. It can't just be like I've, I've seen some that were written by a dentist. One guy turned one in that was written by an OBGYN, like really, <laughs> you know, so it's got to be legitimate because they're going to, the board is going to verify that that, that person actually wrote it and, he, and that you are his patient, right? right. And yeah, he has the authority to be able to do it. And some people, I mean, what they do is, you know, they, they, want to, they, they, they decide they, they want to get a pet. And so they go to their, their, their you know, general GP who they've seen for 20 years. And they say, oh, I, doc, I need a letter. I need a letter from my association. You need to, you know, and, and you can get forms, right, from the Humane Society. Right. And, and, and some associations even hand them out to people who want to make a request for a, a reasonable accommodation to have a, an animal. And, you know, so, you know, they come to the doctor and say, oh, here, you know, just fill, you know, sign this. <laughs> and, you know, with, that, with no examination, without even making a determination that the patient has a disability as required, you know, as defined by federal law, doctors will sign it and voila. And, you know, there are, and, the, and this is what gets some associations really mad. Mm -hmm. Right. right. Be, because they figure, okay, this is bogus. Mm -hmm. It's not like they really have a disability and they really need an animal, but we got to let them in because this professional signed the letter right. that says all the right things. Right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, and so, um, and you were talking about some letters, and you have some examples of letters um, yes. that are. Yes, and some of them, I mean, like, some of them will ask questions. What is the connection between your disability and the requested accommodation? And that's kind of like a, a direct no-no, because you're asking them what their disability is, and which is something you cannot ask. Right. That's you can a, only a, ask the, what task does the animal perform. Right. You cannot ask them any questions about their disability. Right. And, and that means that, you know, even when, if they show up, you know, at the board meeting, none of the directors can say, well, tell us what your disability is. Correct. Tell us what function you can't perform. They can't do that. Right. That's a, a right off the bat. That's a no-no. That's a violation. You get hit with a big fine. So those are questions you cannot ask. Right. And also, like, if you ask the doctor to disclose information about the patient, that is also, number one, you can't ask it. Number two, that's a HIPAA violation, you know, healthcare. Um, violation. So it, the doctors can't disclose that, that disability at all, at, all, at all. Right. In other words, HIPAA basically says that, that is private. What, what, it, whatever health condition you have. Had. But it, you know, if this person is in a conversation, that person can, can, can you know, talk about their disabilities, you know, ad right. finitum, because then it's the person disclosing. Right. But right. If the board were to ask, and that's where it, HIPAA says, no, you cannot ask. Right. 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 And if, and if you ask, then it's a violation and, you know, um, the, there are big fines involved. And these are forms that, uh, and, you know, those, you know, you guys who are listening, Humane Society, I think, has forms. I think the Humane Society forms are pretty much current. and They don't ask questions like that. I mean, if, if you have a form that's been developed or that's being used by your association, you might want to have... Your general counsel, check it out to make sure it's still current because, you know, fair housing is, is a law that keeps changing. And, uh, and you know, and some of these, uh, uh, the forms that are out there, you know, at least these two that we have, you know, don't seem to comply with the law. Yes, so, make, so all the condos need to make sure that they're in compliance with the correct fair housing laws in the language that they use in their forms. Right, and, 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 you know, by using a form that, you know, asks questions, asks for information that you're not supposed to be asking for, can get you into big trouble if, if they, you know, if the, uh, uh, the person, you know, wants to go to the Humane Society, uh, not the Humane Society, the, the Civil Rights Commission, and complain about the association. So you really need to have those forms uh, checked out. And, you know, uh, while we're at it, w w there's talk that there's going to be some legislation in the next session. Why don't we yeah. talk about what, okay. what the legislation is going to be all about? Okay, so part of it is to um, kind of crack down and really come down on the people that are, that are fraudulently writing the letters, that are really not authorized to write the letters. Um, but they're only doing it because, like, if you're so, my patient, <laughs> and, you, you know, I've seen you for 20 years, you want a pet, and you come to me with a form, and I'm just, sure, really, and I'll sign. Where do I sign? I'll sign. But they have it under their medical license. They have an ethical duty 
Um, and there's ethical standards that they have to also comply with. So some, in some cases, writing that letter will be a violation of their code of ethics under their medical license. Right, because just, you know, um, in, in the form, what they're basically saying in the form is that if, 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 if you were the resident and I'm the doctor, the form basically says, Raylene Kennel is my patient. Mm -hmm. I'm the professional who's signing the letter, so I have to attest under oath that you are my patient and that I've examined you and that I have made a professional determination that you are suffering from a disability as defined by federal law. That means that I have looked at the federal law and I know <laughs> the definition of what a disability is and you have it. Right. Right? <laughs> right. And so when I sign this letter, you know, when I sign this letter, I'm telling the whole world that I've done, that, that number one, you're my patient, which you are. Number two, that I've examined you, which I haven't. And that I've, based on my examination, I found out, I've determined that you have a disability as defined by federal law. And I haven't done that, but yet I'm gonna sign this paper. But if I, by signing it and not doing all those things, I've violated my license so that uh, somebody can complain against and if I, you know, so it would be the medical board. Right. And the medical board could, could have a hearing and decide, you know, we're, you know, you shouldn't be doing that. We're going to fine you. And if you do it again, maybe we'll take away your license. Right. Those kinds of things, right? Right, right. Correct. right. And the whole purpose of this statute would be to make sure that the people who are making, signing the request for reasonable accommodations are complying with their professional and ethical obligations when they write these letters. Correct, correct. Really, really bringing, bringing, bringing the whole issue down to um, what's real, you know, and get rid of all the fake stuff. I mean, it, you know, people have to realize that when you go into a condo, the people that bought in there, bought into, their, into, the, into the building um, for, for lots of reasons. Um, some of it was because it's uh, pet friendly, pet, not, not pet friendly, because they don't like dogs or they don't like animals because they have allergies or they just, some people just can't stand the barking. They don't want to deal with that. Um, like cats, you don't want to go buy an apartment and it just reeks of cat litter, you know? So, so I really truly believe that some people have to be, um, be aware that there's reasons why people bought into certain buildings and because they, have to they don't like Yeah, they have to have respect for those people. And, and there are organizations in town, including the Humane Society, that have pet friendly buildings and Correct. they even they show up them. on the internet right pet friendly buildings you want to you have a pet you want to live in a condo live in those condos right 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 instead of picking a condo that has a no pets policy and then 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 you're you're going counter uh you know to the people who live there and even if the board gives you grants your request for a reasonable accommodation all condos have rules mm -hmm. and if your pet if you don't clean up after them, if you don't let, put them on a leash, if they bark, if they create a nuisance, they can ask you to remove the animal. Yeah, because most of the buildings that were typically no pet buildings, but now because of the situation, they have, they've had to allow the pets, they are now constantly picking up dog poop. Yep. Where they never had a problem before, you know. So some people that want to bring in these pets, I mean, you guys are creating the part of the problem. Yeah. You know, because you're not even picking up after your own, your own dogs. And I know we could go on and on and on, but we've run out of time. And so, so, so we're going to have to, we will, I'm sure we're going to come back and revisit this during the legislative session when that bill go, goes through. And we'll let you guys know what the bill number is so that you can call in and, and, and offer your support. But anyway, thank you for joining us for this episode of Condo Insider. And please tune in next week for another uh, exciting and informative episode of Condo Insider about condo living. Thank you and mahalo. Thank you.